Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today is Thursday the 28th, the day that the heavenly bodies are standing on the shore and the flood is getting ready to be spewed out, if I understand those signs correctly. In the last video that I did, one of the comments was, I've heard another person say that Egypt in prophecy is America, is the United States. So how do you come to that conclusion? So I realized that this is really an important foundational piece to understand the end time saga. And even though I made a couple of videos about it in the past, I thought I would make one fresh and put all the information together as I now understand it. Because anyone that's been doing these studies with me for a while know that I am studying and learning. This is a process that I'm going through. And I felt inspired to share those studies with whoever else might want to go through this process with me. So I do not consider myself an authority. These are just studies that I'm doing. Years ago, I came upon the story of the Bereans and I decided I was going to study to show myself approved, someone who could rightly divide the word. And in doing so, one of the things that I have found is that just like Yahushua Jesus said that he, get, he speaks in parables so that seeing they see not and hearing they hear not, because this is the message of the kingdom and it's given to the children of the kingdom. So everything is put out there in plain sight, but only those who are seeking through the word with the influence of the spirit are going to have understanding. In the Old Testament, what I'm seeing is that there is a weaving of so there's a thread that will have a certain amount of information about a topic. You come to another thread, Exodus, and there's another piece of the puzzle. And you come to another thread, a whole other book in the Bible, and there's another piece of the puzzle. And it's not until you have thoroughly searched his word that you can put the picture together until the whole blanket becomes woven and you can see the pattern that's being created. So this is just what I have seen as I've studied. So it may seem like the scriptures I'm reading are not leading yet to answering the question of why is the United States Egypt, but that's because you have to follow all the threads in order to be, have a solid foundation. So please bear with me. I'm going to start here in 2 Samuel 7. So what had happened is that um, Samuel was dining with David and uh, he was thinking about his marvelous house that he lived in made of cedar. And he was thinking, but the house of Yah is still in a tent. So I need to, I need to build a house just as grand or grander for, for Yahweh, for God. And um, the prophet, maybe it was Nathan actually and not Samuel. But anyway, that's beside the point. So the prophet came back and said this after sleeping on it. So I'm in 2 Samuel 7. Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel whom I commanded um, to shepherd my people Israel, saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh Sabaot, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Because right now the kingdom is united and the whole thing is called Israel. And I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a great name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Wait a minute. This is really interesting. They are already in the promised land at this point. This is David who is king over all Israel. So They've been in the land, the promised land for a long time. But it says here, moreover, like he's saying, and besides, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. 
nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them anymore. Well, they're already in the promised land. So where are they going to, where is this place that he's going to appoint specifically for what he calls my people Israel, where he's going to plant them? Now you see that the verbiage the there, my people, Okay, let me show you something interesting from Isaiah. So Isaiah 19 at the very end in verse 24, it says in that day, every time it says in that day, it's talking about the last days. This is the winding up scene. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. So whom Yahweh Sabaoth shall bless saying, blessed be what? Egypt my people, Assyria, the work of my hands and Israel, my inheritance. What does that say? Egypt, my people. What did we just see in second Samuel? Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Is that not fascinating? And it's also fascinating, right? That He's trying to tell us that coming together in this land of Egypt are going to be three peoples. But they're all his people. They have to all be Israel because there is one shepherd and there is one sheepfold. So they're all going to be numbered as Israel. But he's separating them right now to help us see the full story. So first, it's Israel which he's calling Egypt, my people. Then it's Israel, which he's calling Assyria, the work of my hands. And then it's Israel, mine inheritance. It's all the same people, but they're coming in, th in three people groups. Can you see that clearly? So then we're going to go to Genesis 49, where Israel, Jacob, is giving the last blessings to all of his children. And he says that these blessings represent what will befall them in the latter days. That's in the first couple verses of this chapter. So then you come down here and it says, it's giving all these blessings to Joseph, which includes, I love this part, the archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him, but his bow remained in strength. So he's gonna go this, through this time of great trouble. Okay. And the arms of his hands were made strong. How were they made strong? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. That's what it says in the scriptures about this time frame. How were they made strong? By the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd. So this is a reference in the Old Testament to Yahushua HaMashiach, to Jesus Christ, the Savior. From there, because who else would be the shepherd? From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That is who is going to strengthen Joseph in this time of great trouble that he's going to go through in the latter days, because this is what is going to befall him in the latter days. And remember, just from the very beginning, Joseph is a fruitful bough by a well. The well is the waters of life. So Joseph is going to be a Christian nation. He's going to have the word of Yahuwah. Hang on, I'm going to tell you, that I'm going to go to another scripture. Okay, I'm in Hosea 8. I'm going to go to verse 12. But first I want to show you in verse 11 who the subject is here. We are talking about Ephraim. And what, so one of the sons of Joseph, this is the tribe of Joseph, and he is the birthright tribe of the tribe of Joseph, okay? It says, I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. Then it goes on to say, now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. They're not actually going to return to Egypt physically. They're going to return to a type of captivity that they were under in Egypt. I've got a lot of verses where I'm going to show this to you. So this isn't the one, but just kind of start to let that percolate in your mind as I go through the rest of these verses, okay? But this is a people who had his law written. They have the Bible. This is the people who have the Bible. But they were considered a strange thing. But they've thrown it to the side. It's antiquated. There's no value in it, right? We are not a Bible reading people anymore. Very few people read his word. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing. It was only 
around that time that, um, for instance, the pilgrims left um, and came to America. Why did they leave? Because that was the time in history when uh, books were being published, when the average person could get their hands on a Bible and read it for themselves. Because before, all the word of God was being given to them through the mouth of priests and preachers. And they were being told what to think and, and, and what was in God's law. But for the first time, they could read it for themselves. So these are the people for whom for the first time, readily available, they have written the great things of my law, but they considered it a strange thing. They threw it to the side as if it were nothing. So Joseph is a fruitful bough, a fruitful bough by a well, right? The living waters. His branches run over the wall. He has gone to another place, and we're going to see that further down. Let's go look down here. Um, now I'm going to get to the point. I am so sorry. There is so much that jumps out at me, and I have a hard time just laser beaming to my point. I apologize for that. Anyway, um, the blessings here in verse 26 of your father have excelled or exceeded the blessings of my ancestors. Okay, so the father that we're talking about right here, he's speaking to Joseph. So he's saying the blessings of your father, of Joseph's father, that's going to be Israel or Jacob. So the blessings of Jacob have excelled or exceeding the blessings of who's giving the blessing? My ancestors, Jacob's giving the blessing. So the blessings of Jacob have excelled the blessings of Jacob's ancestors. Okay, wait a minute. So he has been given a blessing that is unique to him, that is above or beyond the blessings that were, giving, were given to Abraham and Isaac. And then the very next statement is up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Okay, so now what we're talking about is we're talking about a boundary. This is a land boundary. There was additional land that was granted to um, Jacob, and it is becoming the inheritance here of Joseph. Because it says in the very next statement, they, these blessings, shall be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. Okay, once again, making the point that he is separated from his brothers. He's gone over the wall. Okay, and he's got this additional land grant. And so then I wonder, and what did it just say in 2 Samuel 7? Because I've said a lot since then. What does it say? Um, moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, right? They will be three in the land, Egypt to my people. Okay, that's still going to be Israel because everyone that's gathered is going to be Israel. Um, Assyria, the work of my hands, and um, Israel, my inheritance, all right, which is the great exodus that's going to be the woman that's going to be gathered to the place of safety, okay? But the first people that are going to step on Mount Zion are the 144,000. There is a first group that's coming there, okay? And this is Ephraim. And this is, they become the great sign, the signpost um, that gets um, displayed for the rest of the world so that they know where this place of safety is and they gather there. Some of them, I'm sure, supernaturally, whoosh, whisk there. Some of them by other means, you know, I, I, I don't know. Will all of that's going to figure itself out. But um, that's the additional land grant. And I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. And it specifically is addressed to Israel. And Yahweh knew, knows the end from the beginning. So he knew that these two kingdoms were going to split. And you notice that when they split, it is the northern kingdom that took the name Israel because it belonged to them. Because Joseph is the birthright tribe, he has the right to the name Israel. This is why the southern kingdom then took on the name of Judea. Okay, it's the land of Judah. And as a matter of fact, in the book of Isaiah in chapter 19, it talks about the land of Judah. Because Isaiah knows the names and the peoples who the land of Judah was or Judea versus the land of Israel or the people of Israel. So the people of Israel... Okay, 
there is going to be a place where they will be planted um, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Okay, and this is where Mount Zion is going to be established. And I, I think I'm going to show this to you, but it's going to take a number of scriptures. So that's why in Genesis 48, it grabs my attention. This verse right here, it says, God Almighty appeared to me at loose in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you. And I will make of you a multitude of people, a multitude of nations. And that's what it says in Ephraim's blessing, which I should take you to down below, that he will become a multitude of nations and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So what did he say? He would give them a land and they would move out no more. They would not be moved anymore. Okay. An everlasting possession. Okay. This land to your descendants after. So this land I always thought was the original land grant, the original Holy Land. But now I'm thinking differently because he says this right before the blessing of the two boys. Right. And then he tries to, he puts his right hand on Ephraim, which Joseph's like, no, 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 no. Ephraim's not the firstborn. Um, and then he says, I know my son, I know. He also shall become a people, and he also shall be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his descendants shall become a multitude of nations. Okay, so this is Ephraim. Now, there are so many verses and so much I can show you that I'm trying very hard to kind of focus here, um, because I can take you all over the scriptures, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to focus. I'm going to try really hard. They, okay. So I'm in Hosea. Hosea is the story of Ephraim. It's just simply what the whole book of Hosea is about from beginning to end. Okay. That is the wife that was unfaithful. That was put away. That was divorced. Okay. They shall not dwell. I'm in verse three of Hosea nine. They shall not dwell in Yah's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. They shall not offer wine offerings to Yah, nor shall they, their sacrifices be pleasing to him. It shall be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their own life. It shall not come into the house of Yahweh. Um, okay. I'm going to go down to verse t six too. I want to read that. For indeed, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Now, Ephraim is not literally going into the physical land that is called Egypt today. And that was Egypt in the antiquities. That is not what's happening. Um, uh, sh should I take you to the prophecy of the eagles now? I think I will. Okay. Hang on, we're going to come right back to Hosea. Okay, even before we go to Ezekiel about the prophecy of the eagle, I want to understand what the eagle symbolizes for Israel. Um, and we get that from the book of Exodus and the book of Isaiah. So in the book of Exodus, it says, And Moses went up to Elohim, and Yahweh called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. Okay, so he is commanding Moses to tell the people that him um, saving them or or. Um, bringing them out of Egypt was like him bearing them on eagle's wings. This is how he deals with his people. That is, this is what this symbol means to his people. It is, it is Yahweh, as if he were an eagle bearing him, bearing the people on his wings. <clears throat> then we're going to come over to Isaiah forty. And let me just show you how this starts. It says, comfort, yes, comfort my people. 
And it is Isaiah himself in 19 that says that the land will consist of three peoples, Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. Isaiah was very careful, actually all the prophets were, about using these key terms so that we could go back and put the puzzle back together. So that's who he's talking to, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So let's go, let's go down. And what does it say? But those who wait on Yahweh shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And this is the last deliverance right here that it's talking about. This is the end story. Okay, once again, like wings of eagles. So then we go to Ezekiel and Ezekiel uses this same imagery. And he tells you who he's speaking to in the very first verse. And the word of Yahweh came to me saying, son of man, pose a riddle and speak a parable because he loves to speak in parables so that seeing we see not and hearing we hear not unless we're led by the Ruach, by the spirit. So speak a parable to the house of Israel and say, thus says Yahweh Elohim, a great eagle with large wings and long pinions full of feathers of various colors came to Lebanon. What is Lebanon? The white mountain. And actually Lebanon is used in um, latter day connotations as, as another word for Mount Zion, the great white mountain and took from the cedar, um, the highest branch. So this is a branch that is being taken off of one of the cedars of Lebanon. Lebanon was in the Northern Kingdom. Okay. He cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it to a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants. Okay. Now this is very interesting. This land of trade and city of merchants, I believe is England. Okay, so this is Ephraim being taken to settle in England. Okay, I'm going to run you through a little bit of Isaiah 23 um, that I think bears out that the tire of the latter days is England. Be ashamed of Sidon, for the sea has spoken the strength of the sea, saying, I do not labor, nor bring forth children, neither do I rear young men, nor bring up virgins. So this is all about... Um, imagery having to do with the kingdom of God. So this is, they are no longer the woman that is going to bring forth the man child. Um, they're, they're not in labor. They don't bring forth children anymore. They're no longer a nation that is spreading Christianity, right? They're not bringing forth children anymore. Neither do I rear young men. Okay, so they're not bringing forth men of Yah, right? Nor bring up virgins. So virgins are those that don't go whoring after false religions. So the, the few that are staying in religion are all in false religions. There aren't any virgins who are following the lamb wherever he goes. When the report reaches Egypt, they also will be in agony at the report of Tyre. What report? That they have they are no longer a nation from which um, Christianity, the, the, the true good news, is pouring forth into the world. They've, they've, they've given that up. Now, when you go down to verse 8, it says, Who has taken this counsel against Tyre, the crowning city, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are the honorable of the earth? Okay, well, what is the crowning city? I mean, we just had someone enthroned there, what was it, last year, um, who's now suffering from cancer. But anyway, whose merchants are princes. Absolutely. Doesn't that make sense? The uh, Yahweh Sabaoth has purposed it to bring to dishonor the pride of all glory, to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. Well, you ships of Tarshish, for your strength is laid waste. So up until the time of World War II, I looked this, this statistic up when I was studying Isaiah 23 a little while back. Um, there were more merchant ships um, coming from England than from anywhere else in the world. 
up until World War II, that late. And so it says, now it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre will be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. So um, that's really interesting because Great Britain did seem to lose its strength during um, the reign of Queen Elizabeth, who recently died, and she reigned for 70 years. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre, as in the Song of the Harlot. Take a harp, go about the city, you forgotten harlot, because that's what we just read up here earlier, right? She's not, she's not bringing up any more virgins. They're, all she has in her is false religions. That's what everybody is going after. Make sweet melodies, sing many songs that you may be remembered. <clears throat> And it shall be at the end of 70 years, so after the reign of that one king, that Yahweh will deal with Tyre. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. And who is one of the major players, especially when it deals with climate change at the UN? Their current king, the current king of England. She will return to her hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her gain and her pay will be set apart for Yahweh. It will not be treasured nor laid up. For her gain will be for those who dwell before Yahweh to eat sufficiently and for fine clothing. So all of this treasure that, um, that the king or the royal house has treasured up, is going to be repartitioned to Israel. So in my understanding, that is the city of merchants. So let's go back here. We're in Ezekiel 17. A great eagle with large wings and long pinions full of feathers of various colors came to Lebanon and took from the cedar the highest branch. Okay, so from Israel from the cedar, from the, from, from the greatest tree or the greatest tribe, which would be Ephraim, okay, the highest branch. <laughs> he cropped off its topmost young twig and carried it to a land of trade. He set it in a city of merchants. This is Great Britain. Then he took some of the seed of the land, all right? So this is the seed from the city, um, of the merchants and planted it in a fertile field. He placed it by abundant waters and set it like a willow tree. So that is trying to take our mind back to, um, um, oh gosh, it's in two places. Uh, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of Yahweh, in the Torah, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Remember, this is the nation, Ephraim is the nation that we just read in Hosea, who was given the word of the Lord, but they considered it a strange thing. So this is the people who have the Bible and they can meditate on it day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. So look at this planted by the rivers of water. What did it just say about this tree? Where am I? In Ezekiel. It said, then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. Okay, this is the second inheritance, the pleasant land, up to the bounds of the everlasting hills, right? Um, oh, gosh, the Spirit is reminding me of something. I'm going to overwhelm you guys. Hang on. When I say hang on, it's because I'm going to go look up a scripture and I don't want you guys to have to wait while I look it up. So um, here I am in Deuteronomy chapter 33. Um, I forgot to show you that there is a second place where it talks about this land grant when we were talking about that earlier. OK, this is the last blessing that is given um, by Moses to all of the tribes of Israel just before he leaves them and they cross over the River Jordan. And this is the blessing that was given to Joseph with the precious fruits of the sun, with the precious produce of the months, with the best things of the, look, 
ancient mountains with the precious things of the everlasting hills. There they are again, these everlasting hills up to the bounds of the everlasting hills. That is how it's described in, um, in the Genesis blessing that was given. Okay. Um, wrong Genesis. It's this one. Okay. So it says, have exceeded or excelled the blessings of my ancestors up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. Okay. Same verbiage. And there's a reason why it's the same verbiage because it's to cast our mind forward and backward so that we'll put these pieces together. Let me go back to Ezekiel because I think that's where I was. Um, okay. Yeah. So then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. Okay. Up to the bounds of the everlasting hills. This is the fertile land. Okay. He placed it by abundant waters. Yes, they had the Bible printed that we had, we could have it in every home, in every hand. It, it was in all of our hotels. It was everywhere, right? And set it like a willow tree. Okay. So a tree planted by the rivers of water. There's one other place where that's mentioned, and I think it's significant. And that's from the, the um, prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah jumped out at me very early in my studies. And the reason why is because what he was told his mission was. It says, then the word of Yahweh came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you. What? A prophet to the nations. Not a prophet to Judea. It doesn't even here say Israel because Israel is found among the nations and they don't know who they are at this point, right? It says a prophet to the nations. So here's where it's mentioned again is Jeremiah 17. Um, it says, thus says Yahweh, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from Yahweh. So it tells us in the book of Isaiah that the people are destroyed because of the wickedness of the leaders. They're the ones leading the people astray because the people are listening to other people, which is what led his people astray before, right? Which is why when he brought, he started to bring um, Israel out from all over the world to their new promised land, which was the United States, with them came his word. So that they could, through the Holy Spirit, get into his word and, and, and not be confused, not be destroyed. But his people considered his word to be a thing um, of not, something that they didn't, they, they didn't esteem, right? Esteemed it as, how did, how did that go? As a strange thing. So, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh a strength, whose heart departs from Yahweh. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert, and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, and a salt land which is not inhabited. It said, Blessed is the man whose trust is in Yahweh, and whose hope is in Yahweh. For he shall be like, here it is, a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. There it is in two places. And it is exactly what is going on here in Ezekiel. Then he took some of the seed from the merchant city, from England, right? And he um, and planted it in a fertile field. This is the new land grant up to the everlasting hills. He placed it by abundant waters, okay? So they had the word of God and set it like a willow tree. What do willow trees do? They are water hogs. They will die if they're not close to like a lake or or a stream or if they're in someone's yard they got to be watered 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 okay and it grew and became a spreading vine of low stature its branches turned toward him but its roots were under it so it became a vine brought forth branches and put forth shoots but there was another great eagle with large wings and many feathers. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and stretched its branches toward him. Okay, so this other great eagle came along, right, which I think is our government, right? And instead of 
um, our roots and our branches now um, being fed by the word, right? Then we're going to turn to this other eagle. And um, the rest of it is about the condemnation that happens to this people. It says, it was planted in good soil by many waters to bring forth branches, bear fruit, and become a majestic vine. So then the question is posed, will it thrive? Will he not pull up its roots, cut off its fruit, and leave it to wither? So uh, there's going to be a great destruction. But then in the end, here's the end of the story. Going down to verse 22, thus says Yahweh, Elohim, I will take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I will crop off from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. This is Mount Zion. This is Lebanon. On the mountain height of Israel. This is Israel, not Judah. Okay. I was making a point earlier that when the two kingdoms separated, the southern kingdom became Judea, the land of Judah. Why? Because they don't have the right to the name Israel, because Ephraim is the birthright tribe. So no land can be named Israel unless it has Ephraim in it. And that is not the case in the land that is currently being called Israel. That is not Israel. That is not Israel. Okay, so on the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it and it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort in the shadow of its branches. They will dwell and all the trees of the field shall know that I, Yahweh, have brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, Yahweh, have spoken and have done it. So just to kind of wrap this up with a bow, I have two more places to go. I've got to go back to Hosea, and then I've got to go back to Isaiah so that you can see the whole thing come together, okay? Um, so they shall not dwell in Yahweh's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Now, this is not talking about physical Egypt. So let me go, before I even finish this, let me go to Isaiah to help make that point. So here in Isaiah, you have, um, starting in Isaiah 9, um, okay, Yahweh sent a word into Jacob, and it shall be lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim, and the inhabitants of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of their heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore, Yahweh shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So this actually happened in antiquity. This is, this is a prophecy about the destruction of um, ancient Israel. So that's what we start out talking about. But I'm going to show you that this is not just talking about the ancient destruction of Israel, but it's also talking about the second time that he's going to come and strike Israel in their new land, in the place where they are now, which is being called Egypt because spiritually they're Egypt. Now, um, this is not the first time that Yahweh uses this kind of language. He talks about Jerusalem, which is spiritually Sodom and Egypt, because those are those behaviors of those two people are ways to describe the behavior and situation of his people. So this is not a new thing for him to do. So anyway, so this is Egypt and uh, this is, I'm sorry, this is um, the Northern Kingdom in its first smiting okay it says for the people turneth not to him that smiteth them neither do they see Yahweh have oat therefore Yahweh will cut off from Israel head and tail branch and rush in one day 
The ancient and honorable, so these are the political leaders, is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies is the tail. So both of these are going to get cut off in a single day. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. Therefore Yahweh shall have no joy in their young men, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to kind of skip down just a little bit. So I want you to be thinking in your mind that even though this is talking about ancient Israel, this is actually us, I mean, us right now. And it's really interesting because it's going to make a flip in a minute. And we're going to be talking about Egypt instead of talking about Israel, even though this prophecy is about Israel, because he's making that correlation. And he shall snatch on the right hand and, the hung and be hungry, and he shall eat on the left hand, and they shall not be satisfied. They shall eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, and Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together shall be against Judah, because Ephraim, Manasseh, and Judah are all going to be in the same land at this point. And it's a really interesting point, because this is the melding pot of the world. And there are more people who um, there, well, at least there are population wise, last time I heard, as many Jews here in the United States as there are physically in the land of Israel. Okay, so remember, Manasseh, Ephraim and Judah are all going to be together. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Now this hand is stretched out still is not the hand of mercy. This is the hand of judgment. So even though they've gone through all of this, they, they, they are just absolutely at each other's throats um, politically and, um, and through maybe racial um, divisions and whatever it is. They're, they're just all over each other, right? Um, but that's not the end of the judgments. Now comes the next judgment, okay? Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievous um, grievousness, which they have prescribed. Okay, so these are the leader. These are the political leaders who are writing bad laws and doing it to hurt the people, to turn aside the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. That's what they're up to, right? They are they are ramsacking the people through their bad laws. And what will ye do in the day of visitation and then the desolation which shall come from far? To whom will ye flee for help? And where will ye leave your glory? So there is some kind of a desolating sickness. Now that desolating scourge is actually described in depth in Isaiah chapter 28. Okay. And it is specifically prescribed to the drunkards of Ephraim. So this is who this is, this is targeting. Without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. So here comes the next judgment. O Assyrian. So now this is talking about the Assyrian, right? This is the great leader that is going to be a tyrant. The rod of mine anger and the staff in their hands is mine indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical na nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like mire in the streets. For he saith, by the strength of my hands, I have done it. And by my wisdom, for I am prudent. And I have removed the bounds of the people. Look at this, removed the bounds of the people. Okay, so he's he has um, taken away the boundaries of the land allotments, right? And have robbed their treasures and have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand has found as a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. And then anyway, I'm going to go down. And this is the point that I really wanted to get to. So I didn't want to read any further because I don't want to bore you guys. But we're going to get to Isaiah 10 and 20, okay? This is still the same chapter. It's still the same message, but this is what it morphs into. And this is how you know that that whole preceding section was a prophecy to those who were in that time period, but it's also a shadow, a warning for those that are in the latter days. And it shall come to pass in that day. And that day is always talking about the winding up scene. That's the latter days. That the remnant of Israel, this is the remnant talked about in Isaiah chapter 1. Okay, and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, the Assyrian. They're no longer going to depend upon the the leader, right? Uh, cursed is the man who puts his um, who puts his trust in the arm of flesh, right? 
but shall stay or depend upon Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consummation decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So even though we're talking about a people as numerous as the sands of the sea, it's only a remnant that's going to return. The consumption, the consumption, okay? So, um, hang on. So consumption means the state of being consumed. To be consumed is to be used up, to be destroyed, so the consumption decree shall overflow with righteousness. This is exactly what it talks about in Isaiah 19 when it talks about Egypt to my people. In that day shall Egypt in that day. So this is the winding up scene. Okay. In that day shall Egypt be like unto women. And it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of Yahweh Sabaot, which he shaketh over it. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. This is not. Egypt, the land of Egypt. This is the people. Hang on. Remember I told you that Jeremiah is a prophet for the nations. Okay. Jeremiah 30 verse 5. For thus says Yahweh, we have heard a voice of trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But look at this. But he shall be saved out of it. Back to Isaiah 19. In that day shall Egypt be like unto women, just like we just read in Jeremiah. And it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of Yahweh Sabaoth, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Everyone that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in himself because of the counsel of Yahweh Sabaoth, which he has determined against it, determined against the land of Judah. So something terrible is going to happen over there to the land that's currently called Israel. That's the land of Judah. Okay. That's not where this other thing is going to happen. In that day shall there be an altar to Yahweh in the midst, in the middle of the land of Egypt, okay? And a pillar at the border thereof to Yahweh, and it shall be for a sign, okay? So I'm not going to go there. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto Yahweh Sabaoth in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto Yahweh because of the oppressors. And he shall send them a savior and a great one. Okay. That's Yehusha Mashiach. That's Jesus Christ. And he shall deliver them. And Yahweh shall be known to Egypt. And the Egyptians shall know Yahweh in that day. And shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto Yahweh and perform it. And Yahweh shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to Yahweh, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. So he's going to smite it and heal it. In the smiting comes the healing. In the consumption comes righteousness. Okay? Same story over and over and over. I'm not going to take you there for the sake of time because I know I'm overwhelming people, but um, if you'll go on your own to Jeremiah chapter 31, you will see this entire this entire thing being played out. And it tells you that Ephraim is the firstborn within this saga there in 31. And that is when the vow is made. They will make a vow and keep it. That is the new covenant that, you know, that is in Jeremiah chapter 31. Okay. So this story is the same story over and over and over. Um, there is one last thing that I am going to show you though. As soon as I paused it to go and show you that last thing I was going to show you, I saw Hosea and I remembered that I didn't finish that. So now I forgot what I was going to do. But anyway, back to Hosea, because Ephraim has made many altars for sin. They have become for him altars for sinning. I have written for him the great things of my law, but they were considered a strange thing for the sacrifices of my offerings. They sacrifice flesh and eat it. Yeah, we do, but Yahweh does not accept them. Now he will return their iniquity and punish their sins. They shall return to Egypt. So this sacrifice of flesh, 
um, for the sacrifices of my offerings, they sacrifice flesh and eat it. This is talking about the sacrifice of Yehusha Mashiach. This is talking about the bread that we eat in our sacraments. Um, I'm going to show you that to you in another chapter of Hosea. The very next chapter, Hosea 9, they shall not dwell in Yahweh's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt. So they're going to return to bondage. They're not going to stay in, in this um, state of being in the rest of Yah. Oh my goodness. Now I got to take you to another spot. Hang on. Okay, this is Isaiah 28. If you're not familiar with it, please go study it. These, This is addressed to the drunkards of Ephraim. It says, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people to whom he said, this is rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So these are the people that were given the good news. They were taught how to rest in Yahweh, how to, how to um, take upon them the atonement of Jesus Christ through faith and repentance and baptism and the gift of the Holy Ghost and, uh, and the fruits of the Spirit. They were taught these things. They were taught this is rest. This is the refreshing, but they would not hear. This is the people that we're talking about. These are Christians. This is a Christian nation. Okay. But Ephraim shall return to Egypt and shall eat unclean things in Assyria. Okay. These, okay, we're going to move on from unclean things in Assyria. I might, I might explain that to you, but... For the sake of time, I'm going to move forward. They shall not offer wine offerings to Yahweh, nor shall their sacrifices be pleasing to him. What did they say? They would sacrifice flesh and eat it, right? It shall be like bread of mourners to them. Well, that tells us what the sacrifice is. It's the bread. So who takes, who, who offers bread and wine? Who does that? The Christians do. Don't we? We take the bread in remembrance of the body of Christ and we take the wine in remembrance of the blood that he offered for us. But it says that the bread will be like bread of mourners to them. All who eat it shall be defiled. Why? He tells us in Isaiah chapter one. I'm sorry, I got to go there now. <laughs> I apologize. He says in Isaiah chapter one, bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. Incense is, is a key word for prayer. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. You know, when you spread your hands in prayer, even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? Because your hands are full of blood, of iniquity. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rebuke the oppressor, defend the fatherless, plead for the widow, right? Because these are all the unjust laws that are happening in our land. Come now and let us reason together, says Yahweh, though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Okay? All who eat it shall be defiled, for their bread shall be for their own life. It shall not come into the house of Yahweh. So when we're eating that bread, it's, it's just for our own bodies. It's not going to come into the house of Yahweh. What will you do in the appointed day and in the day of the feast of Yahweh? For indeed they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. So Ephraim is not literally in the land of Egypt. He is in the condition of being in the land of Egypt. He is under bondage to the Pharaoh, to the God King of the land. I just remembered what that last thing was I was going to share with you. So I just did a video on this on Psalm 81. You can go back and watch it in greater depth. I'm just going to go over it very quickly. So we have here in Psalm 81 a prophecy, even though... Um, it, where it says this he established in Joseph as a testimony, that is the prophetic past tense, which is used throughout the scriptures. It is so sure to occur that it is written in the past tense. Okay. This is about Joseph in the latter days. This is the end of time. So it says, blow the trumpet at the time, it's not new moon, at the time of the renewal or restoration at the fullness of, so this is when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. It's not full moon. The word moon is not used in either one of those spots. Okay, at the fullness, at the fullness of the Gentiles. 
on our solemn feast day, for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. And remember, we just read that in Isaiah 19, the language of Canaan, when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. That helps cue us in that we're not talking about the ancient land of Egypt, because this is not the language of Egypt. Okay, this is a completely different language, where I heard a language I did not understand. So this is this is a new memorial that is going to be kept, just like we were given memorials when they were taken out of the land of Egypt in the first time, we will be given some new memorials um, the second time, okay? This is going to become a statute that we will keep, just like right now we keep Passover and unleavened bread and tabernacles, the Feast of Weeks, and so on and so forth. So there are all these different things that we do now. We will have things that we do in the future, um, as well. And this is one of them. And remember, I told you to go and read Jeremiah 31, because the whole story that we just read is also in Jeremiah 31. And one of the things that's in Jeremiah 31, that's really interesting, it says this will be a statute to Israel forever, that they will keep this memorial. So right here, just after the new covenant is being taken by the people, they will finally take a vow, make a covenant, and they will keep it, right? Just like we just read um, in um, Isaiah 19 about Egypt. It says, thus says Yahweh, who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar. If those ordinances, now this is exactly the same word that's being used in Psalm. If you look it up in the, um, in the um, Hebrew, it's hok. Okay, for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went through the land of Egypt. But here it is after the new covenant. It says for those ordinances, okay, those hoka, hok, it's actually the plural, hokim, or however they say the plural. I guess I should look it up for you. Let's just go look because I don't want to get anything wrong. Um... Oh, here they're calling it fixed order. No. Hulk. See, there it is. Okay. That is the root word. And the actual word here is um, ha, which means the, hukim. So that's the plural. Im is the plural of um, uh, form in Hebrew. It's not adding an S, it's adding I am. So let me just go back to the verse that I was reading. If those statutes, I'm going to use statutes because that's what they used in Psalms so that we keep it together, okay? If those statutes depart from before me, says Yahweh, then the seed of Israel, it's interesting that it says seed because we just read in Ezekiel, right, um, about the prophecy that the sprig was going to be put in the land of merchants. Then he took some of the seed of the land and planted it in a fertile field. Okay, so it's interesting that it says seed there. It says, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Okay, so I'm hoping that this is making sense. It is big. It is a huge story and you have to go all over the place to understand it. Um, but I hope I explained it in a way that you can understand it. Um, I pray that Yahweh will give all of us wisdom and understanding, that he will fill us up with his Ruach, that we will be like trees planted by a river of water, that we will become full of light and truth. And I say this in the name of Yahushua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen.